we are recording. Thanks, Michael. So, yeah, I wanted to give a um, overview of of how to start preparing exercises for the introductory sort of aimed at novices um, tutorial for workflows with CWL that we are trying to develop at the moment. Um, before I get started, I guess some acknowledgements of the places and the people where most of the material that I'm going to talk through and most of the ideas that I'm going to talk through here have come from. Um, first and foremost, the Carpentries for the reason that we're using their lesson template as kind of the um, structure for, and the theming for the tutorial pages themselves. And also um, because the instructor training program that they provide teaches most of the theory that's kind of um, backing up, I guess, the way that I'm arguing to do things here. Um, as a kind of expansion to that instructor training curriculum, um, there's also this book, Teaching Tech Together, by a guy called Greg Wilson, who was kind of the one of the founders of Software Carpentry and sort of a um, key figure in the whole Carpentry's thing. Um, that Teaching Tech Together book is available to read for free online in its entirety and kind of, yeah, expands upon everything that's in the Carpentry's instructor training and includes, for example, um, an entire chapter about different types of exercises that you can design and use for teaching techie subjects like programming and things like that. So yeah, more, uh, more about that as and when I come to it in the material. Um, where have we got up to so far with the, with the tutorial development process? Um, we had this lesson development sprint, back in March of 2020, uh, where a group of us got together to agree upon what we thought the tutorial should look like, I guess, what it should, um, who it should be aimed at, what we want people to know by the end of it that they didn't know at the beginning and so on. Um, and we were able to do that and we kind of distilled that into a few things. Um, one of them, a collection of um concept maps um sort of mind maps of key concepts within workflows and common workflow language that we think novices need to know to be able to get started with it um and how those things connect to each other how they relate to each other i'm not going to talk about those anymore today um i'm going to talk about instead the second kind of output from that lesson development sprint, which was the draft set of learning objectives that we came up with. Um, so these are then, like I said before, we have an idea of who our target audience is and what we expect them to know when they arrive for the tutorial, either because we're teaching it in person or because they find the web page online. Um, and the learning objectives tell us what we want those people to learn after they arrive. So what we want them to know by the time they leave. Um, those have been added to the tutorial pages as they exist on GitHub and on GitHub pages at the moment. Um, and they've been split up into kind of individual sections based on what seemed, at least to me, to be kind of logical chunks of learning objectives that seem to relate to each other. And so now the next step uh, in the process is to um, start designing exercises that will assess learners' progress towards each of those learning objectives. This is part of what's referred to um, as reverse um, instructional design reverse kind of lesson design where you start off figuring out who the people are you want to teach then you figure out what you want to teach them then you figure out how you're going to test whether or not they've learned what you're uh what you're trying to teach them and then once you've got that you can start filling in the material in between those exercises to deliver the information that they need in order to be able to solve those um, challenges 
so yeah, we're now at this that exercise design kind of stage of this process. Um, and one kind of key thing to mention right now is that these exercises, the idea is that they will be uh, what's referred to as formative assessment. So there's these two different types of assessment that you can do. Formative assessment, which is kind of done during the, lo the learning process. Um, and summative assessment, which is kind of the final exam once that's designed to be provided as an assessment once all the learning has been done. So it's kind of the example that we give in instructor training is the formative assessment is when the chef tastes the soup there's still time to kind of adjust the seasoning or I don't know, throw it out and start again if you really need to. Whereas summative assessment is when the guests taste the soup, it's too late by then to change anything. Right. Um, so what we want to have is kind of at least one exercise per learning objective that's been, that's been provided. So for example, if the learning objective were um, that by the end of the, section or by the end of the tutorial learners should be able to describe essential job input parameters uh, in a yaml file then a suitable exercise in this fill in the blank style might be this one fill in the blanks in the input yaml below and then some kind of example scaffold yaml for the input file but with um, blank spaces here denoted with these underscores uh, that the exercise would then be for the learner to have to fill those those parts in uh, all right so yeah the exercises should help you as the instructor um, if you're teaching in person at least or virtually online as we're doing more and more often now um, should help you assess whether the learner has learned what you've just taught them or if the learner's coming to the tutorial web pages on their own time and reading through and working through things on their own, it should also help them assess for themselves whether or not they've understood what they've just read. Um, and so the example in the previous page would check whether the learner understood that the file input has to be of class file and must have like a path field included in it. Um, and the idea is that if the learner answers incorrectly or can't answer the the assessment, that also gives you some information about what's gone wrong, if you see what I mean in the learning process. So, um, so this is referred to as diagnostic power. It's particularly relevant, I think, when we talk about multiple choice questions, which I'll come on to in just a moment. Um, the idea with a multiple choice question is that as well as having the correct answer somewhere in there, each of the incorrect answers that you provide as other options should be, uh, I think, the like technical term in the literature is a plausible distractor it should look enough like a correct answer that it stops the it makes the learner stop and actually think about whether or not it could be the correct answer and the from your side as the as the kind of teacher the instructor um if someone chooses the wrong answer it, it helps you diagnose in what way they are misunderstanding what's been taught to them um, and then that means that you can much more quickly fix that problem um, in their understanding and move on to to the rest of the material. Um, it's also important that the exercises are regularly spaced throughout the material and that there are quite a lot of them. Um, the reason for that is that if you're going to use these exercises to help you identify where and how and when the learner has misunderstood something if the exercises are happening pretty often you catch that problem as early as possible and don't have to backpedal half an hour through the material to correct something um that then has kind of perhaps led to further problems uh, down the line with with other material that the learner's gone through um the other reason for for wanting to have these fairly frequently is that um, it helps to break up the amount of m new material that's being um, delivered, that's being kind of handled by the learner um, in their working memory um, by applying what they're learning in one of these assessments the idea is that it helps them shift that new information that new knowledge from their working memory where they've kind of 
first taken it in to the more long term memory because they've this this act of actually applying the knowledge helps to helps to transfer things to long term memory and free up the space in that working memory to then go learn new things um if you want to learn more read more about the like um cognitive load theory um and what the research shows about this um then yeah those those resources that i mentioned at the beginning the carpentry's instructor training curriculum and that teaching tech together um book will will give you a lot more of an overview of what the research says about these things and why i'm talking about doing them these these ways so then taking examples from the chapter on different types of exercises uh, from Greg Wilson's book. Um, let's talk a little bit about what I see as potentially suitable exercise formats for a tutorial like this. Um, I mentioned already multiple choice questions. Um, with the example given here again, where each of those four options is is plaus could plausibly be the correct answer and and the idea is that the learner will need to really read through each of those and think about whether or not each one is um, is correct. Uh, these lend themselves fairly well for a whole bunch of reasons. They they're good for for use um, in person or in like a virtual teaching environment uh, because they can be deliv delivered fairly quickly and you can get a fairly quick visual overview of the progress that the whole group is making um with a, with a, a question like this um they also if you're if you put some thought into carefully kind of designing the incorrect answers then the diagnostic power that each of those can give you is is really great as well so yeah these these can be very helpful um next up is uh, code and run these are i'd say probably the most common types of exercises that you see in like programming tutorials and and computing tutorials in general the idea being that you give the learner a task and they have to write the code to fulfill that task to get an answer or something um and run it and check that it works um these are fine and i would say relatively easy to write because we're all we all know can think of examples of tasks that we've needed to to write things for but a word of warning it's very easy to make these too difficult for complete beginners um it's very it's very easy to overestimate um the sort of ability of novices to start writing things from scratch um i would say that also the number of ways in which it can go wrong um are much greater compared to like a multiple choice question for example where you've got a defined set of wrong answers and so the the diagnostic power that's provided by it going wrong isn't necessarily as as um, as great as with other formats. Um, really, you need to yourself look at exactly how their code is going wrong to be able to diagnose what the problem is in their understanding. Um, and that is not a limitation of a well-designed multiple choice question. Fill in the blanks, we saw an example of already. Um, and compared to these kind of code and run challenges much less intimidating because you don't have the kind of blank page um intimidation there's the structure already there and it helps the learner to focus only on the specific things that you want to assess in this in this exercise uh, so the example here would be checking that their understanding of how to put ranges into a like a, for a slice uh, in python um next up a minimal fix exercise um where you provide code or in our case like cwl file or something some some part of the workflow um that is broken and we say what it's supposed to do and we say it doesn't actually do that change something so that it does and here there's even more information given we say make one small change so that 
it actually does do the thing it's supposed to do. Um, and so the learner knows that they're looking for like one specific thing that needs to be fixed. Um, this has the added advantage that it helps the learner to also develop skills in debugging. So reading other people's code or reading other people's CWL files. And my understanding at least is that with a lot of this kind of first steps in creating a workflow, a lot of what you do is take things that pre-exist and adapt them to your own needs. And so having exercises like this will really help learners develop the skills they're actually going to need when they start making their own workflows, I think. Um, uh, theme and variations. Um, so again, this is going to help people adapt existing code for a new purpose instead of fixing a problem you give them working code but working code that does something else and you say now change this so that it does the new thing that you want it to do and i can see how this could be applied in quite a lot of cases with the um uh with with teaching workflows as well you know um one of the easiest ways to get your uh workflow to do the thing you want it to do is find a workflow that someone else has written that already does that thing and then figure out what bits you need to change to adapt it to your purpose um so another kind of key skill that we want to teach to people in this tutorial um and i think this is the last example of an exercise format would be like labeling a diagram um uh you draw out kind of a concept map or some diagram that represents some key thing that you really want people to understand by the end of the of the tutorial but you leave labels blank or something and you provide the labels and you say put these labels in the right place or attach them to the correct number for the different positions um in the in the diagram and then that gives you a nice um summary i guess of how their mental model of the thing that you're teaching them looks um i would say these are probably better suited to like physical classroom teaching because you can draw things out on a whiteboard or whatever and stick sticky notes to them for the different labels things like that um whereas online teach like virtual teaching over zoom or something i don't know if there are really suitable platforms for doing this um there might be I can imagine that you could use like Google Slides for it, for example, and things like that. But it would take a little bit more research on my part to find out what really works there. And for self-directed learning, I think it's difficult because you'd be asking the learner to on their own kind of drag and drop the labels into particular places and have some automated way of telling them giving them feedback on whether or not what they've done is correct. Um, again, if anyone knows, platforms that might work for that then i'd love to hear about it at the end i guess um okay so ends the section on exercises and the types of exercises that i suggest you might want to create for this tutorial um you can read more about all of those in that chapter of the book that i mentioned already um the second thing that we need to talk about here, I think, is the infrastructure of the lesson web pages themselves, because in order to contribute exercises um, to this material, you'll need to have at least some understanding of like how the pages themselves are built and how the material is presented like it is. So the lesson template, this again, it's the Carpentries lesson template that we're adapting, um, is built with a static site generator um in ruby called jekyll um hopefully to contribute to the material you won't need to care about that very much you certainly don't need to know any ruby um and i think except for needing to install a few things to be able to run local test builds on like a local uh, local host server um you won't need to really care about how jekyll is doing things um the content itself is written in markdown um and you are going to need to care about that so if you've never used markdown before it's a good time to go um check out one of the good online tutorials or cheat sheets uh, that can tell you a bit about that syntax um but it's a very I, I have found it a relatively easy to use um, like markup 
language for for simple styling of text um then we also need to talk through some terminology um the carpentries refer to lessons that's the entire tutorial then all of the sections that i mentioned before um the whole kind of web page is then the lesson um the whole kind of website sorry is the lesson of individual pages then the individual sections are referred to as episodes um and they you want to aim for around about 30 minutes of teaching time certainly not much longer than that per section hopefully the way we've split the learning objectives up into the episodes already should help us with that but we'll have to reassess as we go along whether it might be worth again splitting some of those up or i don't know combining some of the shorter ones um and then there's also extras which is sort of supplementary material um St the standard thing is to have like a reference that's sort of a collection of all of the key points from a uh, from a lesson glossary of terms for example notes for instructors to check out before they teach um, that material things like that um, the main place that you're going to need to care about right now if you're planning to contribute exercises as i hope you are um, the episode files then those are the individual sections of the tutorial and it's there that you'll have the kind of teaching material and these exercises mixed in to assess whether um whether the learner has has achieved those objectives um as i said before i've made one of these episode files for each cluster of the learning objectives as i saw them they're all stored in this underscore episodes directory in the github repository um any new files that end with .md um, that are added to that directory will be added to the site and to the drop down menus for navigation and things like that. As long as they have this YAML header that's referred to as front matter for, for Jekyll um, in there. Um, you can, if you want to make a new one, it's probably easiest to make a copy of one of the existing ones and adapt it from there. Um, so please add your exercises into those episode files. The way that they should be written is as uh, tagged block quotes in Markdown. So here's an example. The block quotes in Markdown are uh, marked out by these um, greater than symbols um, and then a space and then anything that you write after that will appear as like a block quote in the in the rendered version of the markdown when it's rendered to html but you can add these tags there's two here one for challenge and one nested in there for solution uh, that will then adapt the kind of styling of this block quote when it's rendered so instead of being rendered as a standard block quote what you end up having is like a, a colored kind of call out box and the solution section is then a drop down um the people can kind of click the button and it expands um drop down isn't the right term i can't think what is anyway it's like an expandable box so that when the learner is ready to see the solution they can click the thing and it and it displays it to them but the rest of the time it's hidden um i wish i'd put an example of the rendered version on this slide as well as an example of the raw markdown maybe i can navigate to the page afterwards and show an example um yeah there's more information about the site infrastructure for this lesson template from the Carpentries uh, in chapter eight of their curriculum development handbook. Uh, this link will be clickable in the um, version of the slides that we'll pro provide a link to under the video. Um, hey, maybe we'll just provide a link directly there under the video as well. Um, but yeah, so head there if you want to read more about the um, the way that the the lesson sites are kind of built more generally but in at least in terms of exercises i hope that i've already provided you with almost all of the information that you'll need um so please don't unless you want to go find out about that stuff don't feel like you have to because it can i imagine get overwhelming um fairly quickly so then we've talked about exercises and how to design them we've talked about the lesson and where to put your exercises so then the last thing that i want to tell you today is how you can actually start contributing um so um you've got a great idea for an exercise that will 
that will assess one of these learning objectives or more. Um, what you can do is head to the GitHub repository, again, the links below the video, um, post in the, the relevant issue. So I haven't linked there either, but that's, uh, I've set up like one large creating exercises issue. And I guess it will be helpful if you posted a comment under that um, to tell everyone else which objective you're working on so that we can avoid everyone piling onto one objective and try to kind of keep things spread out reasonably well. Um, and please, please, please submit a single pull request for each exercise. That will make it way easier for us to kind of review and discuss them um, than if you make four exercises for four different objectives. Then we can't merge any of those until they're all ready. And I'd much rather get exercises in as quickly as possible. Um, Yes, relevant links below the video. I think that that's everything that I wanted to say, that I'd pre-prepared at least. What questions do you have? First off, Toby, thanks so much. This was a great review of a couple different uh, exercise types. Did you have, is one of the slides listing all the exercise types? No, um, I'm afraid not. So they're we'll, individual. We'll stick that in afterwards. We will, yes. And, so, um, and yeah, you can go find out all, about all of those and more from that book chapter. So, fantastic. Yeah. And uh, for people in the future, I'm sure mm -hmm. at some point we'll have examples using CWL uh, mm. of all of these as well. So, for people to kind of may help them um, jump forward for that. Yeah, that would be really great. Does anybody else have a question? Uh, is it also possible to propose exercises so that maybe other people collaborate on to, to develop these exercises? Yeah, I think if you've got a idea for an exercise that could assess one of these learning objectives, we'd love to hear about that as well. The, the, the onus is not on you if you've got the idea to also write the exercise, but um, it would be helpful if you knew who to reach out to who might be able to help make that or something. I like, I, I, I need to stress, I think at this point that I'm get we are getting very close to the point in this development process at which I am no longer the person who can really do everything. If you see what I mean, like I, my actual experience with CWL is fairly limited. Whereas my experience with developing lesson material is yeah is is the more extensive side i guess um but really we're getting to this point where we're going to need people who use cwl or who have learned cwl to pitch in and so i think ideas for exercises that could work are definitely welcome um and bonus points if you can also like um suggest someone who might be able to help actually make that exercise a reality i think that's a good way of putting it. Yeah, thanks, Jasper. I think uh, brainstorming and the issues. So I think there's already an issue for each learning objective or no? There isn't an issue for each learning objective. Um, there is the one large issue for creating exercises. I think that we could make them for the individual pages or the individual learning objectives. There's a lot of learning objectives. So I think maybe as yeah. people go, you can open up a, an issue to help kind of brainstorm uh, what you think would be good. Yeah. And any discussion that gets started uh, will be really useful. Absolutely agree, yeah. What other questions do you have? I'll mute my microphone while my son squeals in the background. maybe a preview of what the submission process is like. So somebody has an exercise or a draft, you know, they know it's not done. It kind of builds for them locally. They send a PR. What, what happens next? What happens next is at least that I receive an email and I go take a look at the, um, take a look at the PR. If, if, if it's a work in progress and the person who's, created it has questions about 
like how to design that exercise or how to include it in the material, then I can answer those. If in a lot of cases, I'm probably not going to be the best person to assess whether the exercise actually, how well it um, fits to the, to the learning objective, if you see what I mean. So it would also be very helpful to have other people with more CWL experience involved in that review process too. Um, we don't have many people here right now to talk about this with, but like we, yeah, as well as submitting exercises and creating issues for discussion and things like that, it would be really helpful if people were also interested in sort of taking a look at those, at those pull requests. Too. I'm, I'm certain we can find folks to help on the CWL side. Mm. And I'm really excited that we've got you as a Jekyll and lesson design expert. Mm. I hope um, so. Another comment that had come up before was the idea of having linked examples that develop a narrative and a story. I think that's fantastic and it's a lot of work. So I think it's really more likely to happen is we're just going to get little pieces done here and there. And then we'll have a couple other phases to align the, uh, uh, the, the tests, the diagnostics, and create that story later. But again, people have a suggestion or a workflow they think one could build up to um, and be adapted for these purposes, you know, very welcome. Please, please let us know about that. We'll discuss it. I think it's going to be, like many things in life, it's going to be iterative. We'll get some things up there. We'll refine them. We'll have many pull requests for the same exercise over time to kind of refine and improve. Uh, we don't have to land it all immediately perfect. That's, I think, impossible. Absolutely. And anyway, if and when we actually teach the thing to other people, that's going to highlight a whole bunch of things that none of us thought of that, that will and won't work, if you see what I mean, and things that need to be added in. It's always the way when you teach something for the first time, you end up with a long list of things that need to be changed in your material. We, we need to accept that going in, I think. Yep. Um, I'm excited okay. to get to that stage. That'll be a really, um, uh, really useful milestone. I'm, I'm out of questions. Jasper, you've got any others? No, I don't have any other questions either. Then I'm going to stop the share. And I'll stop the recording. Thanks, Mike.